Good morning, friends. Uh, we're so excited that you're here with us for online worship today. I know it has been a, kind of an action-packed week uh, for many in our church family. Um, maybe you're excited that football's back this weekend, um, like, like I am, um, or maybe you're one of our kids or students or parents, um, particularly our parents, who are so thrilled that, that school started. Uh, maybe school online or in person got going for you this week. Um, I know that is so exciting and I'm so thankful um, for, for a, hopefully a great first week for you. If you are near a parent, I want you to reach over and give them a high five or give them a pound it because you just survived six months of summer. You're awesome. Uh, kids, make sure that you give your parents a hug um, or a high five right now. Well, um, for our church community, this is a time that we get really excited to um, because as we head into the month of September after Labor Day, um, there are so many great ministry opportunities that we start having and uh, we're so thankful to, to be able to do that. So if you're new to Highland Park Prez or if you're just looking for a way in this, uh, in this season, where, where can I plug in? Where can I find a way to get connected and to grow with Jesus? Uh, we've got lots of opportunities for you and we'd love to tell you about those. Um, really the best first place for you is something that we have called Starting Point. It's an online four-week class that enables you to learn more about who we are as a church um, and really where you can grow as a follower of Jesus here. I'd love for you to join us starting September 23rd. We'd love to have you sign up online um, and be with us. We'd love for every person in our church uh, to find a place where they're growing with Jesus um, in community. And so if that's not something you already have, um, we'll put a link up where you can, you can reach out to us and we'd love to be personally in touch with you. Um, but we have some great opportunities, whether it's um, if you're somebody who's looking to learn more about who God is um, and explore questions of faith, we'd love for you to join in with Alpha. Um, or maybe you would love to join us in one of our uh, growth courses that are gonna be launching over the next several weeks. Um, we are really thankful for these great opportunities and we'd love to help point you in that direction. Well, this morning at our outdoor worship service, um, we had the joy of welcoming 20 new covenant partners into our church family. And I love that even in a time where um, we have to do classes online and we're coming to worship looks a lot different. Um, we have 20 folks um, and we've had folks all summer doing this too, um, who are saying, I'm really ready to put in roots here at Highland Park Press. I'm ready to go deeper with this church community. Um, and I'm really ready for what God's doing in my life. And so I give thanks for that. Um, and I also was so thrilled that we had a dad and his elementary age daughter get baptized this morning as well by immersion. Um, it was a great joy to get to witness that. And it's just another reminder um, that even in a time when it feels like our world isn't normal, um, what's normal anymore anyway, right? Um, but our world isn't normal, um, but God is doing work, uh, the work of transformation in so many lives. And so I hope that's true in your life now. And I hope this morning that as we continue in our worship, um, that we might get to experience more of God's goodness and his grace for us. So now would you continue in worship with me? A king, come let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done, see how his love overcomes. He has done great things, he has done great things. And I 
know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you'll do Would you pray with me? Father, what a gift it is to be yours, to be your people called out of darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you did not leave us in our woeful estate, that you did not leave us, Lord, living a hollow life, a shallow life, chasing after the things of this world, but that you, Lord, poured your spirit into our lives. You made known your love, your mercy, and your grace. Father, I pray for those nearest to us, our friends and family who do not know you, Lord, children and spouses who do not yet believe. Father, I pray that you would just work a miracle in our midst, that the lost will be found, that the orphan would find a new home, that the one who is hurting and desperate and longing for love would find it in your son, Jesus. Father, I know that there are many barriers, many things that get in the way of people believing in your son, Jesus. But I ask, Father, that you would take it out of the way, that you would remove the stumbling block, that you would remove the thing that is making them hesitate to trust you, Father, would they find in you one who is worthy at all times, one who is steadfast and faithful. Father, would you help us, your people, to be bold and courageous, to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and God. What we know in our hearts that we are not salesmen of Christianity, but we are simply your sons and daughters that we are people so impacted by the good news of what Jesus has done that we can't help but share it. But when we are afraid, and there will be times when we are afraid, Father, would you help us? Would you comfort us? Would you remind us that you are with us? Father, I thank you that you do these things, that you invite us into your work here in the earth. Lord, I thank you for giving your son, 
and forgiving your spirit. And I also pray um, thanksgiving to you, Lord, for teaching us this prayer um, through your son, Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, recently my son was given this uh, version of the Bible called the Action Bible. And it's got all these pictures and it really tells the stories of scripture in a superhero action kind of way. And, and my son Wheeler, he loves it. and He wants me to read it to him every night. As a dad, I'm so thankful for that. Until the other night, uh, we got to the story of Samson. And if you know the story of Samson, it's a pretty incredible story with some rather dicey moments, not the least of which is Samson's magic mullet. But my son has always been curious. He asks a ton of questions. And so after we read about Samson, the floodgates opened. Dad, why did Samson kill all those people? How big was the jawbone? Why were there so many mommies in that story? And by the end of bedtime, I feel like I've done more spiritual harm than good. Like, how do I get this back to Jesus? And so I thought, what would Cameron Beatty do in this moment or say in this moment? And so I said, Wheeler, Jesus is like the greater Samson and he fiercely loves you. Now go to bed. When Jesus left this world, his last promise, the last promise he made was this. You will be my witnesses. You will tell the world who I am. But sometimes, kind of like me trying to explain the Bible to my seven-year-old, it's like we get confused or we, we make it complicated. And so we end up not really being a witness to anybody. I mean, even that word witness can conjure these anxiety and images of obnoxious, pushy preachers, which I hope is not the way that you think about me. Or it just makes us feel guilty because we're not, we don't witness enough or we're not very good at it. And, and so that makes us feel defeated. And, and so we end up not sharing the story of what God has done in our lives. This fall, we're taking time as a church to walk through the book of Acts. And, and it's one story after another of ordinary people who went out into their neighborhoods into their cities and really to the ends of the earth to share what Jesus had done to change everything for them. And today we meet a guy named Philip. This is in Acts chapter 8, and we're just going to walk through this passage verse by verse. In Acts chapter 8, we'll start with verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south down to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now the backstory here is that Philip has had this great ministry going on up north in Samaria. It was growing, the crowds were getting bigger, and it's right in the midst of all this momentum that God says to Philip, I want you to leave it all and go south. This is one of those moments that kind of confronts our Western achievement-oriented, you know, we have to reach as many people as possible mindset, which of course, it's a great thing to want to reach as many people as possible for Jesus. But sometimes, sometimes God calls us away from the many to reach the one. And this call comes to Philip. He hears the Spirit of God and he obeys. Uh, Remember, we're calling this series the Acts of the Holy Spirit because this is all about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, as we walk through this text, notice how Philip, he's so in tune and attentive to the Spirit. We're told, verse 27, so he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. So Philip goes south and on the way, he meets this high-ranking official in the Ethiopian government. And here's, here's what we know about this man. First, We know that he's got quite the job. He's basically the finance minister of the nation or the country of all of Ethiopia. This is a man who wields great influence. Second, we know or we're about to find out that he can read, which is a rare thing in the ancient world to to be literate. So not only is he a man of influence, he's well-educated. He's an intellectual. And then third, as we're about to see, he has a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And what that tells us, and we tend to kind of miss this because we live in a world where there's a Gideon Bible in every hotel room, but but back then, people didn't own Bibles or books. They didn't have scrolls or libraries or their own copies of books. Scrolls were incredibly expensive and were usually kept in public places and government offices or, or, or in schools. On rare occasions, a wealthy person could buy their own scroll. So here's a man with a lot of money. He's made it to the top, he's brilliant, he's educated, he's wealthy, but it all came at a cost. It's interesting, the Greek word used here for eunuch and the word for a high court official, it's the same word in the Greek. 
Now, I'm no dead language expert, but how in the world did that happen? Well, if you were an ordinary lower middle class person in the ancient world, not royalty, and you were gifted enough or driven enough or the right doors open and somehow you found your way into the halls of power and to influence in the royal courts, the only way that you could preserve that role of power at the very highest levels was to become a eunuch because that was the only way that you'd be trusted not to pursue your own personal gain at the cost of the royal family that you were serving. In other words, you had to give up your future family to serve theirs. So this man, he makes it all the way to the top and he had to pay a price. And then one last thing we know about this man is that he's searching. He's spiritually searching. And we know this because in verse 27 we're told he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. So here's an Ethiopian, which, which means he lives on the edge of the known world at the time, and we're told that he's on his way back from Jerusalem. So think about this. The round trip journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem was a months long journey. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how he got permission to take that much PTO. Like he had to ask, explain to his boss what he was doing and everybody else who was asking him like, what's going on? Are you going to 30A or Colorado? Are you summering in Carmel? And he's like, actually, I'm going to Jerusalem to worship a God that none of you believe in. And his friends are like, why? I mean, we have religions here. We have gods and temples that you can believe in. I mean, what would lead a man of such influence and wealth to do something like this? This has to be a man who's searching for something that can fill the emptiness and the void and the longing for. He, he knows that there's something more to life than what he's been pursuing. He's searching. And so he makes this dangerous, costly journey, hundreds of miles to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, what he finds and scholars have written about this. It's very likely that he would not have known this until he arrived. But there's someone standing at the door of the temple. A man who hasn't had a door closed to him in years. And here he is, someone says to him, your kind isn't allowed in here. No eunuchs, no one who's been sexually altered can come inside. Imagine the disappointment, the shame, Right? Coming all this way searching for truth or for something that he hadn't yet found and he comes all this way only to be rejected and humiliated and reminded of his deformity and now he has to make this long journey back home. Verse 28. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet and the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Isn't this a fascinating scene? How do you stay near a chariot, right? You have to run. So Philip is like Forrest Gump running alongside the chariot. It's one of these odd details that makes a story like this actually almost more believable because you wouldn't put a detail like that in if you were making it up. Philip comes along the chariot and he sees inside, he sees this man who's reading from the prophet Isaiah. So here's a Jewish middle-aged guy running alongside a chariot with, the Af with an African treasury secretary. What an odd encounter. Uh, Tim Keller writes about this, how one of the reasons the Holy Spirit seems to be so absolutely involved in every single little detail of this story is because of what was at stake in this encounter. When Jesus was alive in, in his ministry and his teaching and with his disciples, he was always talking about how he came for all peoples, all races, all cultures, which culminates, of course, in the Great Commission, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And the Greek word there is the word ethnos. Go to all the ethnicities, all the ethnic groups. Then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, You are my witnesses, and not just here in Jerusalem or in Judea, but to the ends of the earth. I mean, Jesus could not have made it any clearer. I didn't just come to save people like you, I came for all people, all nations, all cultures. And yet when you make your way into the book of Acts, it's like God has to almost drag his people to reach beyond themselves and, and, and to go beyond their own kind of people. God has to convince Peter to go to this uh, Gentile named Cornelius and then Philip to get him to go to an Ethiopian, an African. 
over and over, the Spirit is giving these specific directions. Go down that road. Do you see that chariot? I want you to stay alongside that chariot. In other words, the Holy Spirit is leading this movement that transcends ethnic barriers and racial barriers and all these divisions that separate, that splinter one people from another. And so church, Highland Park Prez, if we're listening and attentive to the Spirit of God, He will lead us through barriers that normally divide. That's why the the redemptive potential of what God is doing right now in our city and in our country in this cultural moment, drawing together black churches, white churches, Asian and and African churches, we don't want to miss this movement of the Spirit. We don't want to miss out. And we've got so far still to go. Just to step back and look at Christianity around our world today. There's an African scholar, Laman Sane, who teaches at Yale, and he's written a book called Whose Religion is Christianity? And he sort of traces the the explosive growth of the African church over the last hundred or so years, how in the year 1900, there were nine million African Christians. Uh, Most of them, by the way, uh, were in Ethiopia. Today, there are 600 million Christians on the continent of Africa. That's half the continent's population. The Christian faith is growing seven times faster than the population, four times faster than Islam. This is a global faith that transcends cultural, ethnic, racial barriers. So back to the story, verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, just as the Spirit had prompted him, and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? which notice how he starts with a question. Verse 31, the the Ethiopian man said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Philip starts with a question. It always starts with a question. And then he's invited in. He waits to be invited. And that's real important. When we share the story of Jesus, we don't have to push or force our way. We're not responsible for the ultimate outcomes. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Our job is just to be available, to listen to God, to go where he says go. Sometimes our job is just to walk alongside that chariot and wait to be invited in. Now, back to this question. Sir, do you understand what you're reading? How would you expect this Ethiopian eunuch to respond to answer that question? I mean, here's a man of great power, great influence. He's intelligent. He's rich. Normally, we'd expect someone like that to respond with a little bit of, I don't know, a little more ego, like, I don't need your help. Do you know who I am? Of course I understand what I'm reading. How dare you assume that I don't understand what I'm reading? And who are you, by the way, to give me any advice? You don't even have a chariot. I mean, you're jogging. Who jogs anyways? No, look at how he responds. Verse 31, how can I, he says, unless someone explains it to me? It's actually quite surprising how he owns, he acknowledges his need for help, his vulnerability in that moment. How many of us are willing to say, I need help. I need someone to teach me, to show me. I don't have all the answers. That requires humility. To say, I need to learn from other people or I need a community group. I need, to, I need, I need something like Ascent or Anchor because I've got so much to learn about what it means to follow Jesus or I still have questions, all these questions about faith and the Bible So I'm going to try Alpha. This Ethiopian man, he was willing to acknowledge that. So, back in the chariot, verse 32, we're told this is the passage of Scripture the Ethiopian was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? for his life was taken from the earth. Now, if that doesn't just jump off the page, a man who's drawn to a text about being despised and humiliated and rejected. And so the man says to Philip, verse 34, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage, and he told him the good news about Jesus, that there's another man who is despised, humiliated, rejected, his body mutilated on the cross, and he too died without having a family, but in his death was born this family, 
is for the whole world. And then Philip says to this man, there's room for you. You can be part of this family. And I love what Philip does here because, and this isn't going to sound profound, but that's kind of the point. Philip just makes it about Jesus. Philip asks some questions, he listens well, and then he brings it back to Jesus. He doesn't overcomplicate it with all this theology with, you know, well, this text is from Deutero Isaiah, so take it with a grain of salt. No, let's just make it about Jesus. Verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And by the way, we did baptisms earlier this morning, our outdoor worship. Uh, Next week, we're baptizing eight confirmation students, and that's always a celebration. But, But here they are in the middle of a desert. The guy says, I want to be baptized. Well, well, what do you need for that to happen? You travel from this road from Jerusalem to Gaza, and it's straight up desert. The odds of finding a you know, spring water along the way slim to none. So, so maybe this is a little takeaway. God is not limited by deserts and droughts and pandemics by the water we can't find or the language we don't know or the courage we don't feel or the money we don't have, God will provide. He will provide what you need to go where he's calling you to go. God provides water in the desert. But what else? What else do you need to get baptized? You need someone to dunk you and then pull you back up out of the water. The beauty of baptism is it takes someone else. You can't baptize yourself. It requires community. Baptism is the antidote to consumer Christianity. This shallow version of faith where I can pick and choose and just sort of consume what I want to do, on what I want on my own. It's a personal thing. It's just me and God. It's my own individual experience. Not with baptism. That's why we always ask the congregation a question. Will you walk alongside this person? Will you help this family? as they invest in and lead this child to come to know Jesus because we need each other. Baptism requires a community. Right now, a lot of experts are talking about and wondering about the impact of of this online church experience, which I can, you know, watch whenever I want, wherever I want, in the comfort of my home, wearing my PJs with my French press coffee, or I can just If I don't like what I'm hearing, I can move to another church. It's just find another website. And don't get me wrong, I am so thankful that technology has allowed us to stay linked together and connected in this way in recent months and to reach new people. We've had an average of somewhere around 7,000 viewers a week, and I thank God for that. And who knows what God's going to do in and through that. But the shadow side to this is that we can begin to think that we don't really need each other, that I don't need community. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. And if you're starting to think that way, if you're beginning to wonder whether you need community, it is a setup for the enemy to take you down. You need community. You need someone else to help you follow Jesus. You cannot baptize yourself. And so the Ethiopian man, he humbles himself and he gives his life to Jesus. Verse 39, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. I don't know how that happened. It's almost like those Zoom breakout groups where all of a sudden you get apparated into a different Zoom room. But, but I love this moment because it wasn't about Philip. It was never about Philip. And we're told the Ethiopian, the eunuch, did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. What an amazing story. And you know, there have been some times in my life when I've got to see that happen. Someone saying yes to Jesus for the first time. What a gift when you get to be part of that moment. Uh, This past weekend, our Chinese congregation, they hosted their annual retreat. But this time, uh, given the circumstances, they took it online. Now normally, they have 40 or 50 people come on this retreat. Well, this past weekend, more than 500 folks from around the world, from China, Japan, even a few Canadians, people all over our country, And we've been praying that God would open doors, especially in China, for people to hear this life-changing message that that Jesus loves them and and gave his life for them. 
And they invited this uh, famous professor from Princeton to come and to speak and sort of reflect on, on the intersection of science and faith and how you don't have to check your intellect at the door to believe in the claims of Jesus. And a number of people in the midst of this weekend retreat, a number of people for the first time said, I want to know this Jesus. And it is such a gift as a church when we get to celebrate that and when we're invited into that moment. And I'll tell you what else is true. There have been times for me when it hasn't happened. A great story from a friend of mine, Scott Dudley. A while back, he was flying on his way back home to Seattle where he lived. And, you know, in spite of hearing countless sermons about people who get on airplanes and convert the person sitting right next to him, uh, he was just quietly reading his book. Well, the woman sitting next to him was also reading her book, and eventually they struck up this conversation. And so he asked her some questions, like, about her life and her family. And, and then he asked her about the book that she was reading, and, and, and she lit up. She got real excited and, and she said, you know, this book, it's about starting a revolution in America. It's about serving the poor and stopping wars and taking care of the environment and empowering the people. She was real energized by this book. Well, eventually, uh, my friend, she asked my friend Scott, she said, what are you reading? Well, he was reading this book called The Cross of Christ. And after hearing her talk about her book of starting a revolution, serving the poor and empowering the people and taking care of the environment and all that, he lifted up his book called The Cross of Christ and he said, I'm reading about the same thing. Now, it's at this point in the story, according to all the sermons we've ever heard about evangelism, that she's supposed to say, no way, that's exactly what I've been looking for. Tell me more. And he began to explain to her how she's separated from God by sin, but Jesus is the bridge that, that brings them back together. And, and then she prays the sinner's prayer, and then with tears in her eyes, she says, what's to stop me from being baptized? To which he says, nothing. And so he dips his hand into a glass of water, and he sprinkles some water on her head because he's a Presbyterian, and if there's going to be a baptism on a plane, it's going to be sprinkling, not dunking. And now she's a missionary in outer Mongolia, and she has led thousands of people to Christ. Okay, that's the story that he's supposed to tell you. But he can't if he wants to keep the ninth commandment. No, after he showed her the book, The Cross of Christ, she said, oh, enjoy the book. And she went back to hers, and that was the last conversation they had. Didn't even say a word as they were getting off the plane. Not the slightest bit interested. And you know, sometimes that's how it goes. Now, was that a total miss? And maybe the Presbytery should chastise him for evangelism failure? Should he have been more aggressive in his approach and said something like, what happens if something goes wrong with this giant tube of metal flying through the sky at 400 miles an hour? Do you know where you're going? Or maybe, maybe in God's timing, that wasn't the moment in row 23 for that woman to come to know Jesus. And maybe we can trust that God knows better than we do what he's doing in the lives of people he loves, even that woman. And you know, maybe that little conversation, it got her a little curious. And maybe she'll go home and do some research about how Jesus might have launched a revolution where people started caring for the poor and loving their enemies and caring for the environment. And maybe there was a friend in her life who's gonna be in a better place to, to have that conversation about God than, than, than some middle-aged Presbyterian pastor on a plane. God knows. God wants, God wants more than we could ever know to draw people to himself. So, uh, what I want to do as we wrap this up is just to extend an invitation to you and me that for the rest of this month, would we be willing to pray every day at 3 p.m., not because that's a magic time, but because everything has three in this. Would you like set the alarm on your phone even right now for 3 o'clock, 3 p.m., so that you can pray for three people in your life that they would come to know Jesus or that they would come to know him in a new and powerful way and pray for them every single day at three o'clock for the rest of the month. And let's see what God might do if everyone in this church, if thousands of us were to pray and just to ask the Holy Spirit to open more doors for more people to come to know the, the love and the hope that we have found in Jesus. And who knows, who knows, Maybe you will be the one he sends and you'll be the answer to that prayer. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you for, uh, for this amazing 
encounter between Philip and this Ethiopian man. And we thank you that, that faith came to life. We thank you that you continue by your spirit, you continue to draw people to yourself and to your love in our lives today. And we pray that that would happen in the lives of more people that we love. And even in our lives that we would experience you and encounter you in a new and fresh and powerful way. So thank you for this time together. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining our Highland Park Press community online today from wherever you are. If this is your first time, I hope it's not your last. Uh, just as a reminder, we will be gathering in person with limited seating two weeks from today. We're so excited about that. Um, we got all the details that you can uh, follow up with in that link. You will need to RSVP ahead of time just so that we can ensure safe uh, physical distancing. And of course, we'll continue to worship online together as well. Uh, one other little piece of family business, and it's always fun to share news like this. Our fiscal year ended two weeks ago on August 31st, and I'm super encouraged to share with you that, that because of your above and beyond generosity, even in this, this un, unprecedented season, um, we were able to come in well ahead of our budgeted giving goal for this year, and we praise God for that, and, and, and we praise God for you and for what God will do continue to do in and through this church. Um, we've said before, we have about a $9 million budget, but we have a vision that is so much bigger than that. And every single gift, it helps us to reach more people, to serve and care for more people, and to grow more fully devoted followers of Jesus, not just here on University, but now in Old East Dallas with Peak Street Church and with Grace Lake Highlands, our newest congregation starting this fall. Uh, with mission partners truly around the world. Thank you for helping us be the hands and feet of Jesus. And if you'd like to give today, just as an act of worship, I promise you this, Jesus made this promise, that your heart will follow your treasure. So let me offer this benediction. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a great Sunday. We hope to see you next week.